You know, sometimes making a whole review analysis video doesn't really pan out the way you expect. Maybe you'll be watching a piece of media and think, oh yeah, that's definitely gonna make a great review. But when you actually start writing, you find that you may not have anything unique to say and thus nothing new or substantial to add to the conversation. And that's the case with these little cheese bites right here. I had every intention of dedicating solitary standalone reviews for each of these pieces of media, but no matter how much I retooled and redrafted their respective scripts, I just couldn't fully realize a full-fledged review. So, rather than letting them go to waste, I've decided to compile them all here and give my... brief thoughts on each media, and hopefully you'll like it. Welcome to my Misfit Reviews. This isn't a new segment or anything, it's, it's just a one-time thing, don't shit yourself. Clone High Season 2. Or, I'm sorry, the Clone High reboot. You see, now there's a Season 2 to the Revival, which I thought the Revival was Season 2, but apparently we're pretending the OG Season 1 doesn't exist for some reason, so the Revival is the new Season 1, and now we got Season 2. God, I hate you guys. Well, whatever you want to call it, this was easily one of the biggest disappointments of 2023. We waited two fucking decades for this clunky, awkward, tone-deaf excuse for a revival. It somehow managed to get pretty much everything wrong and piss everyone off. I've been promising a follow-up to my Clone High video ever since I released it, and in that time there have been an influx of extensive video essays detailing every single solitaire thing wrong with this season, to a point where it kinda took the wind out of my sails. It was no secret, I didn't need to convince anyone. Everyone seemed to know for a fact that this new season of Clone High fumbled incredibly hard. So what do I say? I certainly don't want to just regurgitate what everyone else has said, and I don't want to plagiarize cause that's morally wrong. So after giving it a good amount of thought, I've concluded that this season was a victim of five main problems. 1. The OG clones are either not in character, barely in character, or completely and utterly butchered to fuck. Abe was demolished in episode 1 and just barely recovers from it for the rest of the season. They really wanted him to be the only one who couldn't understand modern sensibilities, when really that should have been the case for all the OG clones. Joan, the unconforming goth girl from 2003, is suddenly uber concerned about her social status and reputation, a total misunderstanding of her entire character from the OG season 1. JFK's only joke is sex, he's totally codependent on Joan to a point where he's basically her lapdog, and what was once one of Clone High's greatest and funniest characters is now a desperate attempt at comedy. And Cleo. What on God's green earth did you do to Cleo? You, you killed her. You killed her. You killed her and skewered the corpse until it's unrecognizable. You know what? We should be grateful Gandhi isn't here. Could you imagine how hard they'd fuck him up? Two, the new clones are as flat as a day-old soda. They offer nothing in terms of comedy or substance, just one-note caricatures. Confucius is a Gen Z archetype who wants to be popular. Frida Kahlo is the chill art student. Harriet is an anxious theater kid. And Topher is actually pretty funny and has potential to be a legitimately good character, but he barely gets any screen time aside from episodes 1 and 2. All their personalities begin and end with those traits I listed. They are weak as hell. Sure, there's brief nuggets of development, I guess, but nothing that's really meaningful. The only thing I kinda liked was Frida and Cleo hooking up, but that was mainly thanks to the whole eyebrow language joke. Otherwise, there is nothing for me to analyze or explore with these new clones. Three, the show is no longer a biting satire of teen melodramas, which still exist in the 2020s, by the way, but now it's a pandering surface-level commentary on the current times. And hey, I'd be more than fine with that if it was actually clever, insightful, or at the very least, funny. Which quickly leads us to problem number four. It's not clever, insightful, or funny. Like, 
what used to be one of the funniest and boldest goddamn shows from the early 2000s has suddenly been stricken with being painfully cringe. I don't know how you botched the comedy this bad. I mean, look, I know comedy isn't an exact science, but their lack of tact and grace when it comes to tackling the zeitgeist and the sheer amount of not understanding these characters completely destroys the majority of jokes they were going for. The only thing, the only thing, Thing that made me actually laugh out loud was this. <laughs> there, there, sweet principal. It's not that big of a deal. You're fired too, Mr. B. Fuck you, Wesley! That fucking killed me. And it was Mr. B, so obviously it's gonna be funny. Mr. B, by the way, had the only good episode in the season. It was the only time they put actual effort into the writing. Also, the different animation styles were very cool. Yeah, that was... That was pretty awesome. And the final and biggest problem this show has, problem number five, is Lord and Miller. What the f fuck happened to you guys? When was the exact moment you stopped giving a shit? They've gone on record saying that most of their career was them trying to build interest and traction for a Clone High Season 2. And this? This is what you give us? This is the result of all your hard work and passion? Now look, I know Lord and Miller didn't personally write every episode of the season. They hired some new writers. However, they did approve all those scripts. They read all this bullshit, all this cringe social commentary, all this character assassination, all these terrible jokes, and said... Yeah, that's good. The blatant disregard these two have had for quality control when it comes to their writing nowadays is staggering, maddening, but ultimately disheartening. I used to love these guys. The Lego Movie, 21 and 22 Jump Street, Mitchells vs. the Machines, and the first Spider-Verse are all exemplary pieces of good comedy and good writing. And now they've seemed to have gotten very big heads and think their shit doesn't stink, and that's led to this absolute fumbling of one of their greatest hits. Clone High Season 2 Season 1 Reboot Revival is a train wreck. Lord and Miller had the chance of a lifetime to revitalize their old TV gem and become more culturally relevant than ever, but they failed. Failed like a quail on an existential scale. Also, you guys put your animators through hellish conditions on Across the Spider-Verse, and that seriously soured my enjoyment of that movie. So, uh, yeah, eat my ass. And those are my thoughts on Clone High Season 2. Or, I'm sorry, Season 1 Addendum. And no, I won't be covering Season 3. Or, I mean, 2 or three, or four, or five, or six, or anything else related to this dumpster fire. Fuck that. I don't care if it gets better, or even if Gandhi comes back. I'm done. I am done. My enthusiasm for this show has tanked harder than the box office for Mars Needs Moms. I still love season one, the OG season one. It'll always be iconic, but this season will unfortunately always be a blemish on its legacy. Like a swift penis straight to the face. Calamity. This movie comes to us from the same director and studio of Long Way North. It came out in 2020, and it definitely slipped under most people's radar, mainly because this film has not been released in Region 1 and doesn't have an English dub. It's exclusive to Region 2, and one of the few HD copies I could find online was a YouTube rip that only comes with Spanish subtitles. You have to do the shitty auto-translate subtitles for English subs, and that shit is unreliable and finicky as fuck. But honestly, this movie is so straightforward, so simple, and so short, even my anglophone ass was able to understand the story completely. And in that regard, you could say this movie is really good. In fact, this was almost an underrated animation segment. By all accounts, it seems to meet the criteria for that segment, but the reason it made its way to this video is because, well, 
In all honesty, there's not much to review. It's about a young Calamity Jane traveling to Oregon with her family and expedition group. She tries to prove herself a worthy member by defying 1863 social standards, doing all the things little girls weren't supposed to do in those days. Look at her go. But when a traveling soldier, one whom they provide hospitality to, ends up stealing valuable items from the group, Martha Jane Canary takes it upon herself to go on a search and rescue mission for those goods and prove to her family that she's a strong, capable, and reliable leader. And she does exactly that. She gets the goods back, she helps the travel group through some rapids, and she proves them all wrong, and yay, we did it! So yeah, this story is about as bare bones and simple as you can get. Nothing about this story really screams cinema. Like, it doesn't feel like a movie, it feels like an extended Saturday morning cartoon, which isn't helped by the fact that this isn't even an hour and a half. And since the story barely had anything for me to chew on, I did didn't really see it worthy for an underrated animation. Same goes for Calamity Jane herself. This is a very small and safe window into her childhood. Like, one of the most famous women in history with multiple exploits and achievements gets a basic vanilla girl power story. That kind of feels, uh, undermining? I think that's the word I'm looking for. Like, I understand Rami Chaye is trying to make a family film here, but come on, man, you can be a bit more daring than this. I'm not saying you have to explore the darkest aspects of her life, but I don't know, maybe give us a more compelling character arc? The substance here is severely lacking. As far as character, theme, and plot are concerned, they're just good enough to get a passing grade. It's played so excruciatingly safe. The best thing I can say about this film is that the animation, layout, and color theory are fucking immaculate. Almost every shot I said to myself, holy shit, the color work, saturation, and lighting are simply stellar and far surpass the cold, muted visuals of Long Way North. Nothing against Long Way North. In fact, it is 100% the better movie. Let's just make that clear. But in terms of visual presentation, Calamity has got it beat. They make the vast, endless landscapes of 19th century Western America look fucking gorgeous. And I think we need more romanticization of American land. Japan gets that romanticized, glorified look all the time in animation. What about the West, eh? There's, there's some good looking shit over here. Anyway, as I said before, there's unfortunately not much to analyze or talk about with this movie. It's painfully simple, which makes it really hard to offer a worthwhile review. It's completely harmless, and your kids will probably enjoy it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not really worth your time. Anyway, on to the next one. Origin, Spirits of the Past. I actually have a lot of nostalgia for this movie. It was one of my pre-teen weeaboo phase favorites. I was downright enamored with this film at one point in my life, but nowadays I find it very difficult to say anything positive about it. Every time I revisit this film, I always try to find something to praise or decipher some artistic merit, but every time, I'm sorely disappointed. And to tell you the truth, if it weren't for the nostalgia value, I most likely wouldn't even give a shit about this movie. Which is a shame, because I think there's some legitimately good potential here. It has one of my favorite opening scenes where a biodome base on the moon gets destroyed by the ever-growing sentient vegetation, obliterating the moon into chunks as dragons made of vines and branches pierce through Earth's atmosphere and wipe out the majority of humanity. That is one hell of an opener. And unfortunately, that's the best this movie gets. We transition to 300 years later, where our bland Rice crispy Patty protagonist Agito discovers a cryo chamber with a girl named Tula locked inside. Tula is from 300 years in the past when Earth fell to the clutches of the forest spirits. Since then, humanity has been divided into two factions. The peaceful colony of Neutral City, who seek to coexist with the 
spirits and the industrial military nation of Ragna, who seek to reclaim the world for humanity's glory. Ragna is led by Shunok, another person from the past who seceded from Neutral City and founded Ragna along with other like-minded humans. Agito and Shunok are extremely dull excuses for a protagonist and antagonist. Shunok has a tad more depth to him considering he genuinely wants to rebuild the world as it once was, but Agito is as typical and as boy scoutish as they come. He is good for the sake of good because he is good and that's good. And what really pisses me off about him is he doesn't have to work or prove himself worthy or do anything to earn any of his supernatural abilities. He's just given superhuman strength and invincibility by the spirits of the forest because he's apparently pure of heart and good and also the main character. And when he quote unquote sacrifices himself by turning into a tree, something the movie establishes is an irreversible process by the way, he still gets to live as an enhanced human and anyway, and have a happily ever after. Fuck off, I hate this. This is such textbook bad writing, 101 in fact. The best character is Tula, but that's not saying much because her development is pretty basic, but it's a serviceable arc and she has far more depth than anyone else. Tula was the daughter of the head scientist of the Lunar Forest Station Project, and she witnessed firsthand the cataclysm spearheading its way toward Earth. The colleagues of her father locked her away in a cryo chamber to ensure her life would be preserved, while the rest of humanity died around her. She awakens 300 years later to a post-apocalyptic Earth, where what little left of humanity is still at war with each other. She's apprehensive, disoriented, and completely culture-shocked. While the people People of Neutral City are kind and accommodating, she opts to leave with Shunok to Ragna, as he too is from the past and can provide more answers, context, and maybe even solutions on how to fix the world. When she inevitably finds out Shunok's methods are ruthless, cruel, and destructive, she stands against him with Agito and ultimately learns to let go of the past and embrace an uncertain yet welcome future. Like I said, nothing mind-blowing, but Considering the other characters, Tula is easily the best one simply because she's, well, a character. So yeah, unfortunately, character writing is pretty weak. And that's the main failing of this film, I would say. The plot is very standard for a sci-fi adventure anime, but there are a few unexplained phenomena such as the druids and what their purpose is, and why the spirits just give out enhanced abilities to random ass humans willy-nilly. These elements are never explained. Theme is pretty basic, but probably the strongest part of the movie if I'm being honest. Tackling industrial versus solar punk pros and cons, with an overall message of letting go of the past and looking forward to the future. It's honestly the most solid thing the film has going for it. The 2D animation is really smooth and exceptionally well done, and the layout work, while very pretty, well made, and nice to look at, is kind of derivative of Nausicaa and Castle in the Sky. And as such, the film doesn't have much of a visual identity itself. But my my goodness gracious. The 3D rendering and war vehicle design in this movie is a bucket of ass. Absolute clownery. Look at this. Look at it. Oh my god. I am so embarrassed for the movie. What the fuck? What are these designs? This is laughably bad. How do you approve this? Anyway, yeah, overall, this movie is pretty forgettable and not very interesting and kinda crap. And whatever it does succeed at is nothing to write home about. I always try to salvage something of value when I watch it, but the only tangible things in this story are Tula and the overall theme of the story. That's it. Oh, and the kick-ass opening. Yeah, that, that too. Maybe you can find something more to love about it, but I certainly can't. Lord knows I tried. Origin, Spirits of the Mist Potential. 
And I'm gonna give it a sticker that says, keep trying. But before we go any further, this video is sponsored by ass. Using ass, you can uh, take a shit. You can even uh, die. So huge shout out to ass for sponsoring today's video. You guys are great. You can click the link in the description to get uh, ass. If you want ass, it's only it only lasts for five days. Tekken Kin Crete. Great googly moogly have I wrestled with this movie. I don't think I have ever revised a review script for a movie more than this one. But you know, guys, I'm gonna be honest. After careful consideration and after seeing this movie God knows how many times, I don't think I'm all that crazy about Tekken Kin Crete. I know, blasphemy. But hear me out. I don't hate it. I don't think it's terrible. In fact, I do appreciate and admire it for what it is and for what it's trying to do. But I found my review drafts just boiled down to me giving the movie a pat on the back strictly for its themes and animation. And at the end of the day, I can't deny that this movie just did not resonate with me the same way it did for many others. Let's start with the premise. Tekken Kincrete focuses on the two brothers known as Black and White. These boys seem to have a chokehold on their home city of Treasure Town. They're a two-man gang who rule the streets and keep everything in line. They're assertive, violent, and extremely territorial. So much so that even Treasure Town's crime syndicates don't want any trouble from them. But... When the Yakuza make their way into Treasure Town, they seek to dismantle the city's humble infrastructure to make way for new economic developments as well as extravagant theme parks. Thus, a turf war begins between the Yakuza and our two main characters. The story here functions quite nicely, honestly. It's kind of like the Hey Arnold movie if it was and anime. And while it's very heavy on the themes and symbolism, they do serve the story well, I just think it's a bit egregious at times. The overall theme and message of the film seems to be about the fleeting nature of childhood, the turmoil that comes with leaving that phase of your life behind, and the existential dread of the ever-growing, ever-changing world. As you get older, the neighborhoods you once knew, the districts and plazas you were so familiar with, get torn down and rebuilt into something new. And this film shows how that can alienate the children who grew up in those places, as well as the adults who have a nostalgic attachment to them. I think that's a very unique and important thing to dissect and comment on. And the movie offers a very nuanced view by providing both the child and adult perspectives on the matter. On one hand, it's important to preserve the past and its relics, but change is inevitable and always encroaching, and nothing can last forever. While I do relate to that theme on a personal level, where this film loses me are its main characters. Black and white are not bad, but I don't find them to be all that great either. However, they are both well-defined, clearly characterized, and we have a great understanding of what their values are. I just, uh... I'm not crazy about them. They don't really hook me into the story. I don't find them all that interesting. I, uh... Yeah, I'm, ca I'm kind of hard-pressed to find anything about them that really struck me. I do, however, like how Black is basically a vicious dog. He bears his teeth to anyone he doesn't like, yet he's completely devoted to protecting his brother. I also love the final scene with the Minotaur, but less for the character development and more for the animation. And as far as White goes, I like the visuals that accompany him when we get to see his perception of the world, but that's pretty much it. I mean, don't get me wrong, I felt sorry for White and his brother too as we approached the third act. Their arc is well paced and executed fine enough, it's just, well, I, I don't know how many times I can say it, just for some reason I just wasn't enveloped in this journey. Not because of a lack of empathy or not being able to relate to it, it's purely subjective on my part. And that's kind of the whole point of the movie. A lot of its value comes from your own subjective takeaway from it. And unfortunately, 
I don't have much to praise, or even trash. It's one of those movies I'm almost completely indifferent towards. Which is weird, because considering how obscure this movie is, its cult following, and how it became somewhat of a forgotten animation landmark in the new millennium, you'd think I'd be screaming about this film from the rooftops. And yet, here we are. The one thing I can obviously praise without any question is the animation, but more specifically the background art. I make no exaggeration when I say that Treasure Town is one of the most impressive feats of layout artistry I've ever seen. Yes, even better than Belleville and Bonta. The impeccable attention to detail, the cluttered lived-in feeling of it all, the miraculous commitment to consistent geometry, Geography, it's absolutely astounding. This is the main reason I keep returning to this movie. I can't understate how gorgeous this environment is. And you know what's crazy? This came out the same year as Origin, 2006. And yes, the 3D, 2D blending in this movie is done so much better. They knew exactly how to utilize the 3D, and whenever it is used, it looks fantastic. And as far as major, major gripes go, like I said, there's largely not much to comment on, but if you really want me to nitpick, there is one inconsistency that that does bother me. Okay, so black and white can apparently fly and have immaculate martial arts skills. And at first I thought, oh, cool, this story is like from the perspective of a kid and their wild imaginations. But no, they can actually do those things. At least that's what the movie establishes. We hear the adult characters reference the fact that they can fly and do all this crazy shit. The movie just expects you to go along with that, which I can totally do, but as you'll see, there's a problem that arises. After the opening scene, we see the boys saving money in a jar, and we also see them pickpocket people for a plane trip out of Treasure Town. And, uh... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, <clears throat> you can fly! Also, why do you want to leave Treasure Town if you're so hell-bent on protecting it from any nefarious outsiders? I guess you could say that it's just planning for the distant future, but still, that was always weird to me. My point is, whether or not the flying and the martial arts are supposed to be representative of the kid's imagination, it's not clearly communicated, and as such, it left me scratching my head. Oh, and you're probably wondering about the name of the movie. Tekken Kin Crete. What the hell does that even mean? Well, apparently the correct Japanese pronunciation is Tekken Konkurito, which translates to Steel Enforced Concrete. And the title, Tekken Kin Crete, is supposed to be a child's mispronunciation of that. How does that correlate to the movie? Well, obviously there's a connection to the child mispronunciation and the fact that our main characters are children, but as far as the concrete thing goes, uh, well, uh, be because of the infrastructure? It's mostly steel enforced concrete? I think? Well, actually, there seems to be an array of materials used here. I don't really see much use of one over the other, but uh, I guess, I guess that's a, I, I you, you know, you, you know what, guys? I don't fucking know. Do I? Do I have to have all the answers? I totally understand if you love this movie. There's a lot to appreciate, and it offers a lot artistically. But no matter how hard I try, I just can't get emotionally invested in this film. The same way you can love a terrible movie, you can also dislike a good movie. I will always hold some level of admiration for it, but overall, I don't think it's my cup of tea. It's an interesting specimen, this Tekken Kin Crete, isn't it? But if there's one thing I can leave you with to tie this whole review up, is that you should always check your dog's ass to see if it's dirty. Hey, thanks for indulging me this one time with these bite-sized reviews. I hope you learned something. 
like how to poison your enemies. I'll be honest, I had these review scripts on the back burner for upwards to a year, and for some of them even more than that. And even though I am sorry I wasn't able to offer standalone videos for each of these animated pieces, I am at least glad I was able to give myself some form of closure with them. They were looming over my head for a long time, and I knew that one way or the other, I wanted to talk about them. Hope you had fun. Hope you have a good day or night wherever you are. Hope you get a pizza. Hope you get a raise at work. At the end of the day, all I really care about is that you give all your savings to me. No one else. I deserve it. Give me your money. It's all mine. I earned it. Yep. I'm important. I save lives. I directed Oppenheimer. Thanks for watching. And always remember, I am the angel of death.